First of all, all of us have sinned. There is none that have walked this earth that are perfect. No one. There's greater degrees, but all of us have sinned and fell short of the glory of God. In one of the darkest times in human history, when the voice of God was silent for 400 years, suddenly, without notice and without provocation, redemption came to all man. And on an old rugged cross, on the stony hills of Calvary outside of the city of Jerusalem, the sins of mankind were redeemed one final time. As God expresses His love for all of man, when He poured His wrath on His Son at a cross, and it appeared that evil had won, He rose, and He was resurrected. He lives that we may live. Grace and peace be unto you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's so good for you to be with us this morning, this afternoon or this evening, whatever applies. And I thank God for all of you and for all of your support. The last couple of years we've endeavored to try to bring the Word of God to all the world around you. And it is my distinct pleasure to bring to you one of the most wonderful expressions of God's love in the Scripture towards fallen man and the unregenerate sinner, I would like for you to turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 8, verses 1 through 12. There are very few narratives about the Lord Jesus Christ, either audio or visual, that does not include this story of the woman caught in adultery. It is a display of God's passion, seldom seen and blunt, and frank and merciful all at the same time. So I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bibles with me to John chapter 8, 1 through 12, and read with me, please. John went up to the Mount of Olives. He went up to the Mount of Olives to pray. And early in the morning, he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he taught them there. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery, and when they had laid her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law said that one such should be stoned. But what do you say? What do you say about this situation? This said they, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. He completely understood and bent down and started writing on the ground. And when they continued asking him, he lifted himself up and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted of their conscience, went out one by one with the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman was in the midst. When Jesus lifted himself up and saw none but the woman, he saith unto her, Woman, where are your accusers? Does any man condemn you? And she said, no man, Lord. And he said, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Three or four of the most powerful words ever getting in Scripture that displays and manifests the nature of God and his redemptive work toward fallen man are seldom seen or more poignant or powerful than these four words, go and sin no more. Five words, excuse me. Go and sin no more. In that moment in time is a reflection of the presence of God leaving heaven and coming to earth.
to stand in a situation that merited judgment and offered ultimate mercy. Outside of the drama on the cross and the subsequent resurrection of Jesus Christ, there are few other physical illustrations of the basic aspects of the heart of God towards sin than the woman caught in John 8. To be fair, theologians, expositors, and apologists have debated the authenticity of these very scriptures for centuries. But as the events of this short but dramatic encounter between God and the sinner unfolds, it is evident that this example of the love of God towards this woman was destined to be part of the salvation of men forever. There are many, many people who believe they're preaching a message of salvation. And they wind up more clearly in biblical arguments and problems fencing over how this works. This is a very simple, very simple message that we are called to give all of the world. In John chapter 8, 1 through 2, notice the day had started innocently enough. Jesus hath withdrawn himself to the Mount of Olives to pray and spend some time alone with God. And all the others had returned to their homes to rest. And very early in the morning, Jesus came down from the mountain and went in the temple, and the people were drawn to him, and he began to teach them. In John chapter 8, verses 3 through 6, the Bible says, And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery, and when they had set her in the midst of the crowd, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? Suddenly, without warning, a woman caught in adultery was thrust upon Jesus by the scribes and the Pharisees. And they explained what the law of Moses said had to be done to such a sinner. But they wanted to know what Jesus thought they should do. Clearly, this was not an innocent inquiry of a rabbi concerning how to apply the law of Moses. This was clearly a conspiracy against Jesus by the scribes and the Pharisees for the purpose of finding reason to accuse him and bring him to trial. Under the law, using the law of Moses for their leverage, they demanded a response. And the scripture that they no doubt were ready to quote to Jesus was in Leviticus 20, verse 10, and in Deuteronomy 22, verse 22. In, De in Leviticus 20, verse 10, the Bible says, And a man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress should be put to death. Deuteronomy 22, verse 22, the Bible says, If a man be found lying with a woman, married to a husband, and then, both, then, then they that both of them shall die, both the man that lay with the woman and the woman, so thou shalt be put away, so the sin shall be put away from all of Israel. But the law, but the scribes and the Pharisees used the words of the law hypocritically in a couple of very important areas that you need to remember. Number one, the law, according to Moses, stated that both adulterer and adulteress were to be put to death at the same time. There is no appearance of the woman's lover, and because of that, she should not have been judged without the other, according to Moses' law. Number two, while being put to death is the conscious consequence of the sin of adultery, the act of stoning is only mentioned in Deuteronomy 22, verses 23 and 24. It's Deuteronomy 22, Verses 23 and 24, If a damsel that is a virgin be betrothed to a husband, and a man find her in the city and lie with her, then you shall bring both out unto the gate of the city, and you shall stone them with stones that they die. <coughs> Excuse me. So there's two problems here. First of all, according to Moses' law, 
They were to bring both of them there to be judged. <clears throat> Only one was there. So technically, if you're jot doing every jot and tittle of the law, they themselves had failed the law or broken the law by virtue of not bringing both of them to be judged by the law. And because they were not both judged by the law, they themselves became sinners in the sight of God for disobeying the law in their zeal to try to trip up Jesus Christ in his judgment. There is no place in the Bible that someone outside of a virgin, while being put to death and implied, there's no direct statement in the Scripture that one should be stoned except that woman be a virgin. In this illustration, she is a married woman in the act of adultery. Let's go on further. In John 8, verses 7 through 9, So when they continued asking him, he lifted him up, himself up and he said, he that, it was out, he that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. Now that's incredibly, that is a, most people take that one way, but that is also he is reading from the law. He has caught them in another abuse of the law they're supposed to be declaring and live by. He that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. That first stone in the law means something. Verse 8, he stooped down again and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted in their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. I can only speculate what was be written on the ground by him. The Bible doesn't say what is written. And I think that there is an over-progressive approach to what he could be. Nobody knows for sure. Nobody knows for certain. And the Bible doesn't tell us. So I acknowledge the fact he could have wrote anything there. But that's not why I'm speaking to you today. I'm speaking to you today why these things happen the way they do in relationship to the law of Moses. But his not, one of the things when he says that, his knowledge of Moses' law concerning stoning catches them all off guard. Because in the law of Moses, when he said, he that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. In Deuteronomy 13, verse 9, the Bible says, but thou shalt surely kill him. Thine hand shall be first to put him to death, and afterwards the hand of the people. In Deuteronomy 17, verses 6 through 7, at the mouth of two witnesses or three witnesses shall he that is worthy of death be put to death, but at the mouth of one witness you shall not put him to death, and the hands of the witnesses shall be first upon him and put him to death, and afterward the hands of all the people. What am I saying here? When Jesus said, he that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone among her. Every single person that was involved in this incident was a witness to what happened. And by being virtue of witness, according to Levitical law, they would be the first ones to pick up a stone and start killing them, and then the rest of the crowd would join. Now, I know this is barbaric. And I know that for some people, this is hard to wrap your arms around how a loving God could let something like this to happen, even for the sin of adultery. God is love. God is love. God. Well, God is a God of judgment. You must never forget that he is also a God of judgment. And if you're doing something you're not supposed to, you need to be prepared to pay the consequence of what's going on here. This woman, make no mistake about it, these are not loopholes to get this woman out of what she did. She was guilty of sin. There is no, there, there's nothing to refute that she wasn't absolutely guilty. There is no admission or confession of her own innocence. She was caught. And Jesus Christ is not looking for a way to, for loopholes in the Scripture. Jesus Christ was looking to dispense mercy, and that's what God wants. You know, the Bible says, He shall have judgment without mercy that has shown no mercy, and mercy rejoices against judgment. Because the first witnesses did not do what the law said, now Jesus Christ is not only looking at a woman who sinned in committing adultery, she was looking at a group of religious leaders that had done just as much evil by violating the law they were supposed to be keeping and using Christ to manipulate. It is very clear, according to Levitical law, that they were just as guilty of sin as she was. 
And when he said, he that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stones. They knew deep down inside, and Jesus Christ knew as well that they had done wrong. They knew they had done wrong. And their zeal to form a conspiracy against Jesus Christ, they forgot the very law they were using as a tool to trip him up. Jesus Christ knows every jot and tittle of the law. Make no mistake about it. And the absence of knowledge or the neglect or demonic influence involved here, when that guilt set in, they were no more ready to stone her than the man on the moon. They walked away ashamed, not that, they, not, not that she did it and got caught, the fact that they wound up getting tricked themselves by their own neglect of the very Bible they're supposed to be the leaders of. In leadership, you have to dispense equal amounts of wisdom, mercy, and judgment, just like he did. You have to read the situation for what it is, and first and foremost, you have to do what's left or what's necessary after the words. You should always look for mercy first. Always. That's the way it works. According to the law of Moses, the first witnesses of this sin should have already picked the stones up and threw them. Whosoever has witnessed this event and failed to follow the law became sinners themselves through the disobedience of the law they were accusing her of. Overcome by their own guilt from the eldest to the youngest, the accusers could not bring themselves to stone her. That's why it says in Matthew 7, verses 3 through 5, And why behold the mote that is in your brother's eye, and consider not the beam that is in your own eye? And how can you say to your brother, let me pull the mote that is out of your eye, and consider not the beam that is in your own eye? Thou hypocrite, first remove the beam that is out of your own eye, and then you shall see clearly to pull the mote out of your brother's eye. The accusers in this particular case were not interested in justice being done but rather entrapping Jesus in his own words. Thus they became tainted, disqualified witnesses because of their prejudice towards the outcome of the case, and everyone else knew it, and because of that and their blatant misrepresentation of Moses' law, they could do nothing but turn around and walk away. And Jesus, in one simple reply, demonstrated how the Holy Spirit applies a word of wisdom in a situation. This word of wisdom meant that Jesus had simultaneously, one, had upheld the law of Moses. Two, the accusers were required to carry the law out and did not. Three, pointed to their culpability as prejudiced evil witnesses in this case. And four, it, presented a sto it prevented a stoning and offers the opportunity for mercy and compassion to come from God. In John chapter 8, verses 10 through 11, the Bible says, When Jesus lifted himself up and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are your accusers? Does any man condemn you? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn you. I have never seen any presentation of the life of Christ in any venue where this story is not presented as part of his ministry on this earth. The reason that there is so much emphasis on this story in the Bible is it because it reveals the core aspects of God's true heart, how he longs for us, and the pathway to reconciliation to him. Furthermore, it is a snapshot of every sinner that has stepped into the presence of God. This woman is a picture of all of us at some point in our lives. Regardless of what we have or haven't done in our lives, this woman reminds us, all of us, the secret and hidden part of ourselves. It reveals a desperate need for absolution and an unshakable hunger for grace and mercy that only God himself is able to provide. This intensely personal encounter speaks to the true nature of the gospel message. <clears throat> and here's how it does it. First of all, all of us have sinned. There is none that have walked this earth that are perfect. No one. There's greater degrees, but all of us have sinned and fell short of the glory of God. We have been alienated from God by sin. Romans 5 verse 12, the Bible says, 
as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, for death passed upon all men, for all would have sinned. <coughs> Excuse me. 1 Corinthians 15, 21 through 22. For since by man came death, by one man came into the resurrection from the dead. For as in Adam all die, so all in Christ shall be made alive. Psalm 14, verse 1. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Psalm 51, verse 5. In sin did my mother conceive me. Proverbs 13, 21. Evil pursues sinners. Ecclesiastes 7, verse 20. For there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good, and sinneth not, no, not one. And Ecclesiastes 9, 18. One sinner destroys much good. Ezekiel 18, verse 4. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Romans 3, 10 through 11. There is none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So all have sinned. Number two, all unconfessed sin will be uncovered and revealed at the presence of God's judgment. There is nothing you're doing that you know is wrong that will not be brought out to you when it's all said and done that you hid. I said this at a Wednesday night class. I'll say this again. If you're dealing with him, honesty is the best policy. You should never, ever, ever be deceptive in any circumstance if you're going to be his. We all make mistakes. We all speak without thinking. We all, may, again, we all do err and come short of the glory of God. But you should be, if you have claimed to have the Spirit of God in you, you have to tell the truth. You always have to try to tell the truth. There should be no exceptions. You need to make it a point in your spirit and soul to always be honest at all times, and you'll never have this problem. Sadly, in this generation, with lawyers and television and slick silver tongue ways to get out of trouble, many people try to live a double life. They try to live their life the way they want and still love God and still believe and worship God without dealing with this, and you're wasting your time. God judges sin. He judges all sin. And the only way that you can find mercy is to ask forgiveness of it. Proverbs 28, 13. He that covers, our sin, he that covers his sin shall not prosper. Just as Adam and Eve were ashamed of their sin and feared the judgment of God and thus sowed aprons of fig leaves in the Garden of Eden, so has every man at some point tried to cover their transgressions. Mark 4, verse 22. For there is nothing hid that shall not be manifested. Neither was anything kept secret, but it should be made known abroad. Luke 12, verses 2 through 3. For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, and nothing hid that shall not be made known. Therefore, whatsoever you have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light, and that which you have spoken in the ear in closets shall be proclaimed upon the rooftops. 1 John 1, 8 and 10. If we say we have no sin... We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 2, verse 4, He that says, I know him, and keep not his commandments, is a liar. Number three, in the economy of God, sin demands justice. Justice demands judgment. And judgment demands payment. Let me say that again. Sin requires justice. Justice requires judgment. Judgment demands payment. Psalm 9, verse 7, the Bible says, The Lord established his throne for justice. Psalm 33, verse 5, <clears throat> The Lord loves righteousness and judgment. Proverbs 21, 3, To do righteous and justice is more acceptable to the Lord than every sacrifice of worship you can do. Proverbs 25, 28, verse 5, Evil men do not understand justice. Proverbs 29, 6, 26, justice for, man, justice for man comes from the Lord. And Isaiah 61, verse 8, the Bible says, For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrong. I will faithfully give them their recompense. In Ecclesiastes 3, verse 17, God will judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time for every matter and every work. There is a day coming to all of you, saint or sinner, 
lost or saved, color this picture any way you want to. There is a day coming when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ. Every man, every sin, every transgression, and every idle word. So number four, you might want to sit back and take a listen to, and this will help you avoid that fateful day. Jesus Christ is the physical manifestation and represents the entirety of the grace and mercy of God towards all evil men. Let me say that again. Jesus Christ is the physical manifestation and represents the entirety of the grace and mercy of God towards the sinner. That cross is assigned to all the world. It displays for all to see what the true love of God really is. Other than that, it is idle words spoken by well-meaning men. He directs men to this cross for the purpose of mercy. When Jesus Christ walked up to this woman, all men still lived under the law. The law was a set of commandments, ordinances, and requirements specifically set forth by God himself. The law reveals three very common threads all through the Scripture. Any book of the Old Testament. Number one, God's holiness. Number two, our sinful nature. Number three, our utter inability to comply with all of the law. Apart from Christ, we as a people are helpless and hopeless, spiritually dead and permanently bound in our sin. No matter how much we pray, no matter how much we worship, no matter how many good works we do, none of them will make us right with God. Mankind needed a Redeemer, someone who would pay the debt of our sins for us. God provided that Redeemer for us in the person of Jesus Christ and His sacrifice and subsequent resurrection from the grave. When Jesus died on the cross, for He paid the price for our sins, past and present were paid for by His blood on that cross. We received the very thing this woman received and probably didn't even realize it. The mercy and grace of God. The mercy and the grace of God. You know, for a long time, people have given me a hard time about this. I don't understand why. At this point in my life, I don't really care. This represents the love of God. And I know that a lot of people think there's other ways, from baptism to speaking in tongues to some sort of spiritual regeneration devoid of this particular aspect of the Scripture. And you're wrong. God sent his son to die for the sins of the world. This isn't a point to win a religious argument. This is a point. There are millions and millions of people that need to hear the gospel in this world. And largely in this country, all we do is bicker about every single thing. There are some things that you have to defend, and there are some things that need to be addressed, but not nearly as many as them that are doing it. I have come to preach the gospel of God's compassion and mercy to this world and by His grace, somehow, some way, I will find a way to get that done because there are people that are going to hell if someone doesn't start preaching the gospel. I mean, I mean the real gospel. So we set out to do this because Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of God and He is the only way to the Father by virtue of this. And in that regard, this is the display of God's mercy to all of mankind. In Lamentations 3, 22 through 23, the Bible says it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Luke 1, verse 50, the Bible says, And His mercy is for those who fear Him from generation to generation. In Ephesians 2, Verses 4 through five, four and 5. For God, who was rich in mercy, for His great love wherewith He loved us, even when we were dead in our sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, for by grace are you saved. That word quicken means to be made alive. In James 2, verse 13, the Bible says, For He shall have justice, He shall have justice without mercy, who, judgment without mercy, who hath shown no mercy, and mercy rejoices against judgment. 
In 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5, the Bible says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy, his abundant mercy, has his abundant mercy, hath begotten us again into a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time. Number five, Jesus Christ offers complete liberty, absolute spiritual, mental, and physical freedom from the bondage of sin by offering to him the form, by offering to all men the form of spiritual rebirth or new life, depending on the biblical term. What good, is it, what good does it do to forgive you partially of your sins and leave you in bondage to others? It's vitally important that you confess all of your sins to him. When the Spirit of God moves you to, to deal with it, all of the secret sin, all of the open sin, all of us must always be quick to repent of our sin as the Spirit brings it to our attention that we are reconciled to God. If he forgives us completely, we need to be transparent with him in all areas of our lives. The effectiveness of a full pardon must be accompanied with freedom. To be pardoned and remain in jail is nothing more than a pardon. It's simply an acceptance of your apology. True repentance brings the forgiveness of God and the mercy of God, and you are free to live your life the way you want to from that point forward without the guilt of your sin. Now that means also it comes with responsibility. When you give your life to Jesus Christ, you must abandon your former life and commit your life to him. He said, go and sin no more. To be forgiven of sins is no way a hall pass to remain in your sin. He is displaying mercy by removing your sin and forgiving your sin, and you must honor that by not continuing to do it anymore. I know that's easier said than done. I know we're sinners by nature. But the concept remains the same and comes from him. The effectiveness of a full pardon must be accompanied with freedom. Freedom in this illustration is not just from the consequences of sin, but also from the destructive pull on our hearts and minds that enslaves us to the, in the spirit. He frees you not only from the sin, but he frees you from the mental state that sin causes and gives you the chance at new life. What Christ offers us now is the sanctifying power of his life, whereby those who follow the Spirit are set free from the desires and passions of the flesh, are enabled to live holy and blameless lives before him in love. Freedom from that slavery of sin is one sure criteria by which all professing believers may test and prove that they have eternal life, with its regenerating and sanctifying grace dwelling in them. In other words, when you get tested by God, or you get tested by men, or you get tested by the devil, Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. In John chapter 3, verse 17, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. In John 8, 32, the Bible says, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Verse 36 of the same chapter. And, the, who, and if the Son therefore shall make you free, you are absolutely, positively, completely free indeed. In Romans 5, verse 20, where sin doth abound, grace doth much more abound. In Romans 8, verse 2, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus had made us free from the law of sin and death. We live forever in the Spirit, forever with God. Romans 8, verse 16, Romans 6, verse 18, being thus made free from sin, you have become the servants of righteousness. In Romans 6, verse 22, but being now made free from sin and become servants of God, you have your fruit unto holiness and to the end everlasting life. In John 3, verse 8, the Bible says, For this cause was the Son of God manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. In 1 Timothy 1, 15, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Jesus Christ came into this world to save sinners, of who I am chief, chief of the sinners. Colossians 1, verse 13, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. Lastly, God's grace demands a changed life. Central to our message of salvation, when we get behind studio or we preach in a church, 
is that when you come to that cross, you are fully prepared to turn away and forsake your old life that you may be free to live in victory. You cannot do this and you cannot say this if you do not have any intention of changing. And I'm not going to sit here and argue with everybody that's got their own take on this. You receive mercy and grace when you're willing to change. And at that moment, that moment in time, when you do it, whether you do it inerrantly in the spirit or whether you audibly say it, you are making a commitment to God that if he will forgive, if he will show you mercy, you will in turn live for him. That is not debatable. That is not subjective. That is not open to interpretation. When he says, go and sin no more, that means if you want the total forgiveness of God, you have to change your life. And there's no excuses about it. And there's no codicils. There's no amendments to this. You must be fully committed to change your life from that point forward in order to receive God's mercy and forgiveness. He's not a hypocrite, and you shouldn't be either. If he forgives you unconditionally out of the holiness and the grace and mercy, you should live your life in gratitude to him for what he's done for you. The irony is you don't hear much of this anymore. And a lot of people think they're all right with God, but they're not. You must make a commitment to change. And I know people like alcoholics and drug addicts have a hard time. All of us have our vices in life that we that are very difficult to overcome. I'm not here to illustrate that. Your only possible way of finding peace and happiness in this world is to commit to live your life to Jesus Christ no matter what else is going on around you. And do yourself a favor, find a church, find a minister, find whatever that preaches the same thing because we have turned this in to anything for anybody and this is a narrow gate and not a wide one. Not only does salvation in Christ enable us to live transformed lives, His grace demands this. Before you came to Christ, you were driven by self-love, characterized by rebellion. But now under grace, the depth of His love motivates us to live in a way that pleases Him. John chapter 8, verse 10, 11, when Jesus lifted himself up and saw the woman by herself, he asked her, woman, where are your accusers? Does any man judge you? She said, no, then neither do I judge you. Go and sin no more. That attitude Jesus displayed with this woman is a microcosm of how he treats every human being. He does not condemn her unfit forgiveness. In other words, he doesn't make a judgment about her for unforgiveness, but treats her with kindness, forbearance, and patience to lead her to repentance. What Christ offers this woman is salvation and a way out of her life of sin. No decision is recorded here. But if she refuses to repent and then enter the kingdom of God, then the condemnation and wrath of God awaits her. These two verses encapsulate the message of the gospel as it relates to God's offering of grace and mercy. Conditional to God's forgiveness is the commitment to abandon the former life that brought them to there in the first place. The sorrow that receives genuine forgiveness is a regret that produces a commitment to living differently. Let me say that again. The sorrow that receives genuine forgiveness is a regret that produces a commitment to live differently than before. Where is that in the Scripture? 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10. The Bible says, Godly sorrow worketh repentance unto salvation, not to be repented of, but godly sorrow worketh death. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. The Bible says, Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you. Galatians 6, 7 and 8. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that he's also going to reap. He that sows to his flesh shall of his flesh reap corruption, but he that sows to his spirit shall of his spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Philippians 3, verse 12, the Bible says, Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Hebrews 2, verse 3, the Bible says, How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Hebrews 3, verse 12, the Bible says, Take heed, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. 
in Hebrews 10, verse 26, the Bible says, For if we sin willfully, after that we've come to the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sin. In Jude, you shall earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. You can wrap up the whole argument of election versus free will and the fact that at salvation, you make a commitment to change your life. If you do that at salvation, then you will never have to worry about what's going to happen in eternity. If you have come to a place where you can't live without God's forgiveness and you are willing to change your life, rededicate your life, you know that you don't deserve the mercy you're about to get. If you know deep down inside that if it was you, you might not walk out of life, you might not walk out of this alive, and certainly in eternity not spend any time with him. God offers you a gift. Everything in life comes with responsibility. It is your responsibility when you stand at that cross and you repent of your sins that you make a commitment to change your life. You make that commitment. The Holy Spirit has brought to you to this place of repentance. There's no question of the convicting work of the Holy Spirit. But you must say the words and you must believe in your heart and you must live by those words, and you're making an eternal covenant with God. You must promise God that you're going to change your ways. Now, people make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. But a commitment to live for God will come with renewed repentance, renewed forgiveness, and renewed commitment to live your life as if you never made the mistake at all, knowing that God is there to help you along the way. No man can live perfectly for God. No one. But a commitment to God will allow God to help you live your lives through the landmines that life offers in this world. God will help you. If you've truly committed your life to God, God will help you through the things and the struggles that men face on this earth. If you make that commitment at your salvation, it's just as important as asking forgiveness. It's just as important. You are changing. To repent means to change your life and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. every Not just one time, but every day of your life. And if you do that, you will never have to worry about what happens in eternity, and you can avoid the religious arguments that continually, continually bog our faith down and cause us to be ineffective. That's the way it is. That's the way it's always been since he did it. We've distorted it, we've changed it, we've made it our own, own thing. But God is unchangeable. He sent his son to die for your sins. He sent his son to change you. He sent his son to forgive you. So today, in the sight of God, I'm telling you, I know there are people that are listening to this that are not saved. You sl slunk into church, found a seat, receive some kindness, and you're still sitting there. Or you got baptized as an infant. You know more. You know more can make a decision for Christ as an infant as you can shoot a gun. So I need you to be honest with yourself. This is not about what church you join. This is not about whether you have to have a changed heart. That's what this is all about. Yes, you must get baptized after the fact. Yes, you must join a church after the fact. That's why he made it. That's why they're there. And the Spirit of God will direct you to the right church with the right pastor. He'll, he'll take you to the right place. If you've truly given your heart, God is not going to leave you in the lurch. So today, as we close this, I'm asking you, have you made your commitment to Christ? Have you? Have you made a true commitment to Christ? Is he first in everything you say? Is he first in everything that you do? Is he first in everything you think? Do you consider the Lord in your decision making? Do you consider the Lord in the words you're about to speak? Do you consider the Lord in the actions you're about to take? Do you think about what he might think about what you're doing? Do you care about that? Because you should. His spirit lives inside of you. So today, in the sight of God and man. I want you to make your, I want you to be sure. I want you to look at me and I want you 
in the sight of God and man to simply repeat with me, Lord Jesus, I come to you just the way I am. I stand before you a broken man or woman in desperate need of a Savior. I'm tired of living this way, and I choose not to. Today, in your sight, I confess and repent, my, repent of my sins, and I receive Jesus into my heart. And I ask your mercy and your forgiveness of these sins. And with my whole heart, I promise you, I will live my life for you and a tribute to you. I will live for you from now on. I make this promise. This is my part of the covenant that I make with you this day. I will fail you. Please forgive me. I won't always be perfect. Be merciful. But I will do my very level best, as much as is within me, to live for you. I ask you to carry me home and help me and deliver me and keep me in this most difficult, troublesome, trying, and perverse generation of people that have ever walked the face of the earth. I will need your protection. I will need your guidance. I will need your hedge. I will need your help every day I live. Be merciful to me and let me grow in this. And I will show you one day how much I truly love you. But today, I just need the chance. I need the chance to live for you. Provide it to me in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.